And now I would like to introduce you a great guest from the UK or Malta, uh, Adam Beck. Adam is a uh, long, long time uh, professional uh, cryptologist and also he's a Bitcoin expert. He's inventor of hash cash, uh, hash cash system. Hash cash uh, was used, for example, by, by Bitcoin. I heard that even uh, Satoshi Nagamato was inspired by, by hash cash. Is it true? Uh, I think I got the first email that anybody ever received from Satoshi, as far yeah. as I know, um, <laughs> just to ask about. Yeah, and the, the, the second thing uh, Slash also told me that uh, hash, cash, hash, hash cash is basically used uh, by mm, Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin mining protocol. So this is really big thing. Uh, also, as I know, hash cash is used by many uh, anti-spam uh, solutions. Uh, so if you have s implemented some, some, some anti-spam solution, it's quite likely that it uses hash cash. Also, uh, I read from your Wikipedia uh, page that uh, you developed also some credibility system from uh, uh, on the ideas of David Chom. David Chom is a cryptologist. Uh, I personally invited him to uh, crypto-anarchistic uh, conference last year, but unfortunately this guy probably, he didn't read his emails. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, maybe next year. And the last thing is that uh, Adam is also CEO of the company uh, which is called Blockstream. So that's very brief introduction and now Adam, it's your turn. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm going to talk for a relatively short period of time, so people should uh, ask questions. Uh, sorry. Okay. Yes. So people should uh, interrupt and ask questions. It's uh, the slides and discussion is mostly to uh, start uh, some structure to a conversation. And so feel free to ask questions as we go or at the end as you prefer. Um, so as, as many people in, uh, in Bitcoin, um, I started as an enthusiast, you know, saw Bitcoin and found it very exciting and interesting. So, and also as many people, I then tried to do something to move Bitcoin forward by uh, starting a company to improve on the technology and so forth. And as probably other people can uh, attest, once once you start a company, now you have multiple hats. So I have to preface what I'm saying by explaining which hat I'm speaking with. So I'm speaking as an individual who is very much likes Bitcoin and wants it to succeed. And uh, as was said in the introduction, I've uh, been playing around with and doing applied research in electronic cash systems for a long time. Um, and also worked at a company building Tor-like things before Tor existed, and uh, e-cash e systems related to that as well. Um, I'm also not a spokesperson for Bitcoin Core. So Bitcoin Core is a decentralized group of people who uh, work by consensus, uh, perhaps in a similar way to the way the IETF runs technical discussion forums. And um, as I said, I'm speaking as an individual. So Blockstream, this, this is the only Blockstream uh, part, this couple of sentences here is that Blockstream as a company that is reliant on Bitcoin uh, need, wants and needs Bitcoin to scale and succeed, the same as any other company. And the other thing to say is that, you know, everybody in Blockstream owns Bitcoin and is excited about Bitcoin. Um, so that's uh, that out of the way. So um, I thought I'd talk about it in terms of requirements. So people who've been through software engineering in startups or companies or various projects know that you, you often interface with a customer by stating requirements. And requirements are not always technical. They're about what is the effect that you want to achieve? And it's a, it's a conversation mechanism to have a, a constructive conversation with a client 
or somebody that's buying something, or the users of an open source system, it can apply there too. And um, it's useful because then the conversation is a level where hopefully everybody understands. The customer understands, or the users understand, and the technical people are sure that they have the same idea about what success is and what the users want. So I suppose the other thing to say is with Bitcoin, it's a little bit ambiguous as to who the customer is. It's an open source project, and it's, it's also a currency and a network, and you know, it's a peer-to-peer -peer currency, so ultimately it's a user currency. So we should uh, most care what the users want and why they value Bitcoin. And that could be sometimes hard to determine because there are lots of users with different viewpoints. And, but Bitcoin also depends on companies to succeed. You know, there are many companies popularizing uh, access to Bitcoin, like exchanges, uh, hosted wallets, to make it simpler to use Bitcoin, and miners. And miners are an important part of the ecosystem to secure it, and that includes pools. Um, so we have to, you know, sort of, if, if we're going to do requirements and engineering around Bitcoin, we have to balance the interests of users and companies. And different ecosystem, uh, you know, miners and payment processors and exchanges may have different and slightly conflicting requirements. If we, to, if we were to optimize solely for the benefit of miners, we might find ourselves wanting to do one thing. If we were to optimize solely for the benefit of payment processors, we might do another thing. And each thing you do tends to have an impact on somebody else. So it's kind of a zero-sum system to some extent. And so we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't uh, want to see a situation where one type of ecosystem player gains an advantage over, over the other because the system has to exist in balance and represent the interests of the users. And the companies, in, in some respects, are basically, you know, they're trying to improve value to users. Users buy their services because they find them convenient, and the companies succeed by delivering value to users and getting more users to uh, start using Bitcoin and build the network effect. So um, other than, so let's, let's talk about uh, a what if. So you know, we, we say we want Bitcoin to scale, but how much? Let's put some numbers on it. So let's say hypothetically, uh, we, want it to, we want the scale to double every year for let's say the next three years. So draw a rough outline of how that's going to happen. Um, but as a requirement, that's something that companies can think about, you know, hopefully we can do better, but it's something they can plan around, you know, they can look at their user growth numbers and um, some, some ecosystem people in, in the business side have uh, said that they think it has been scaling at around this rate over the last year or two. So it's, it's not an arbitrary number, it's something like it has been scaling maybe two times, maybe two and a half times, something like that. And let's, and then the, the more recent interesting technology is this uh, Lightning or Layer 2 protocols where we get much more exciting increases in scale. So it, it depends on some uh, usage patterns, depends on recirculation, which we can talk about later, but you hear numbers like 100 times to 10,000 times more transaction throughput using the same base technology. And we'll talk in a bit about how that works roughly. So taken together, if we, if we can achieve these targets, I hope that, you know, companies would be happy with these targets. And it's a conversation uh, topic as well, because if they can come back and say, well, I, I, I need more or I need it sooner or something, at least you're having a conversation that uh, people who are designing protocol upgrades can work with. So there are other kinds of requirements which are sort of system invariants or hard requirements which are around Bitcoin's properties. So Bitcoin is very importantly permissionless. So the internet opened up permissionless innovation and the permissionless nature of it is significantly credited with uh, driving the fast pace of innovation. And so many people think that this is, that what Bitcoin will allow is that kind of rate of innovation into financial payment networks where it's 
so far been quite clo relatively closed and more like the closed telephone networks pre-internet. So there's some analogy there. And there are other interesting Bitcoin properties that um, we would not want to lose. So fungibility is very important for a payment mechanism. Um, fungibility is, is just the concept that uh, you can think about it with cash, that one banknote or one coin is the same as another. And that concept arose from, so sometimes you can distinguish between banknotes, you know, they have serial numbers. And there was a very old case, I think 17th century Scotland, where <coughs> some, uh, a businessman sent some high value banknotes to somebody else and they got stolen in the mail. And eventually they were deposited at the bank and he tried to sue to get them returned to him as his property. And they had a, a court case about this and the court decided that he should not get the, the notes back because the side effect would be that people would lose confidence in money and money and a reliable money was very important for the economy. So um, that started the legal concept of fungibility and I guess other countries arrived at a similar concepts for similar reasons. Um, and so it's important for Bitcoin to have fungibility in a practical sense. And so you see things like attempts to trace Bitcoins too much or to consider Bitcoins that have been used, let's say, on Silk Road sites or are connected by two or three hops to a transaction that was on there. And if, if we let that kind of uh, activity go too far, people end up with coins through no fault of their own because they're multiple hops removed from the transaction that they can't spend or you know, they can't spend on some sites. So the way, the way it fails in the uh, Scottish banknote case is that if, if the ruling had been the other way, that the merchant had got his notes returned to him, then nobody would want to accept banknotes without rushing to the bank and depositing them. And that, that would cause the currency basically to fail at its primary purpose. So it's important that Bitcoin has fungibility and it's also important that it has some privacy because the entire ledger is public and it's, uh, you know, it would be too transparent. And then we have some functional requirements um, and I tried to put these in what I consider to be priority order roughly which are just things, obvious, obvious things that you need the system to do for it to be effective. So it has to be secure. You want it to be scalable so that, you know, we can mass deploy it and everybody can enjoy the technology. You want it to be reliable and predictable so there's good user experience and you want it to be cheap so that you can use it for, so many people can use it in, in you know, third world countries where the average spend is much lower or for different types of spending. So, and because I was talking about um, requirements, I think it's interesting to ask the question, what is Bitcoin? Uh, what, are, what are Bitcoin's differentiators? And it's quite an interesting discussion to have with anybody you meet who's interested in Bitcoin, to ask them what's most important about Bitcoin to them. And, you know, another way to ask the question can be to ask, you know, which of the features Bitcoin has that if it lost, would you lose interest? Would you stop using it? And so just to run through the top ones quickly, it's it's a bearer eCash. So it's it's cash like, it's irreversible. You make the payment, it's done, you can't take it back. Um it's unseizable because it's bearer, and there's very importantly no third party, no no central point of trust, no bank. Uh so you know that that's important to consider if if, if that is a requirement for Bitcoin, because we could obviously scale Bitcoin by running a central server that holds all the Bitcoins. Um, but that would lose this important differentiator that it's, there's no third party you have to trust. Uh, we just talked about permissionless. It should also be borderless and network neutral. Network neutral meaning that there's no kind of authority or central party at the base layer who can say, well, I don't like that transaction. And you see situations where um, in some countries, I guess WikiLeaks is an example, right? They they had their payments blocked and it wasn't done through legal means. There was, there was no court order deciding that their payments should be blocked. Just some, you know, politicians decided to make some phone calls and ask a favor of a few large companies and they, their payments were effectively blocked. So because Bitcoin's decentral, it has network neutrality and there's nobody to 
call up to achieve that kind of effect. So it can see, it has seen some adoption in areas that are prone to that. So for example, WikiLeaks started receiving uh, Bitcoin donations. Um, fungibility we just discussed, uh, privacy we discussed, and it's, uh, it's, it's virtual commodity, gold-like virtual mining, etc. So um, that's specifically in terms of the economic properties of it, that it's uh, not, not a political currency like fiat currency, and it's purely free market. So there is no central party that can adjust the rate of new coin production, can do quantitative easing and print extra money or uh, buy the money back. There's no party that can uh, adjust inflation, and there's no no party, no central party that could set an, uh, uh, with special authority to set an interest rate. So it's purely free market. And if you look at the uh, sort of standardized three main properties of money of store of value, means of exchange, and unit of account, um, it depends on your viewpoint. But I think, from my perspective, probably the store of value has achieved, uh, has been of the three properties most strongly achieved so far. Means of exchange, somewhat. I mean, people are doing Bitcoin transactions, and that's part of the value of uh, Bitcoin. But you could argue that at present, maybe more of the value comes from an investment uh, perspective. Um, but those things are related. And maybe one of them is more important for a period of time, and then another becomes more important late, later. So I've heard people argue that it's important that Bitcoin achieve a stable exchange rate kind of thing and have a, a stable, robust value because that will make use of it as a means of exchange or unit of account easier. Um, so I don't, that, that kind of area is uh, subject to debate because it's, it's you know, all about economic opinion. Um, unit of account, I guess, uh, you know, this, uh, um, you know, some, some it's like the, the coffee shop downstairs and everything you buy in this building is a sort of test case unit of account. But generally speaking, because of the volatility at times, people have been more thinking about Bitcoin and pricing it in uh, dollars or other currencies. So maybe we'll get there in the future. So now I wanted to talk about um, upgrade methods. So there are a number of different technical means by which we can upgrade the Bitcoin network, so to add new features to it, and they have different trade-offs. And uh, so I think possibly this, uh, the current scaling discussion should have had a conversation around upgrades uh, at an earlier stage, you know, for example, with the scaling Bitcoin conferences or something. This, this could have been a more timely discussion. But let's uh, have that discussion now anyway. And so people may, people are familiar probably with soft forks and hard forks, but there are a few different variants and some of them are more recent or have uh, had more analysis recently. So, you know, um, people are still learning new things about Bitcoin. So there are people who understand all of the code, but the implications of the protocols and ways that you can extend it and upgrade it are still new, new realizations and understandings are being found. And so that's the kind of topic of ongoing learning, even amongst uh, Bitcoin developers and so on. Um, so an example of that is this uh, firm fork or soft hard fork. That's been more talked about recently, and um, you know, it was quite obscure or not not widely understood or known before. So let's talk about the the trade-offs. So backwards compatibility, um, meaning that the existing Bitcoin wallets that are in use today will they be able to still send transactions after the upgrade? Um, and uh, actually, the one of the ticks is wrong here. This this one should be a tick, not a cross. Um, so a soft fork is backwards compatible because you can uh, existing wallets can pay to new wallets, and new wallets can pay to existing wallets. Um, 
full hard forks are not backwards compatible by design because they want to change the all of the formats to improve something fundamental and so all clients you know even smartphone clients and full node clients have to upgrade after a full hard fork um, a simple hard fork is a sort of restricted hard fork that um, smartphone clients don't have to upgrade with and the firm hard fork is a, a kind of hybrid between the two which we'll go on to so now the the sort of one of the factors for an upgrade is how quickly can you do it and how safe is it so a soft fork is quite safe to use and it has been the method of all previous planned upgrades to Bitcoin of which there have been quite a few including some last year and some ongoing this year um, so it's quite well understood how to do them and what the security properties are and it doesn't require a lot of coordination mostly miners have to focus on the upgrade and people who are running sort of merchant software or, or full nodes have to um, do an upgrade reasonably quickly but they have some you know flexibility in that they are protected by miners if they take if they take a little longer um, a firm fork is also fast a simple hard fork it depends if if you do it very quickly it probably introduces risk uh, but if you if you if you want to be conservative then it takes longer than a soft fork and so that's that's a potential topic for discussion then because when somebody is looking at these trade-offs they might say well I want to take the risk because uh, I want to see it quickly or other people might say well I'd sooner it was secure and then if it's slow maybe I would sooner see a soft hard fork sorry a soft fork done first and then a hard fork done later because it can happen more quickly and a full hard fork is similar in terms of speed so then what I was saying about the um, how we have experience of doing soft forks so the way I've expressed that is it's automatic so you don't need to coordinate with a lot of people to achieve the upgrade so the soft fork and the firm fork have that effect of being similar to the uh, you know the historic upgrades that happened in Bitcoin but the the hard forks um, require basically everybody in the network to upgrade so it requires much closer coordination than has been attempted before in bitcoin so there are some you know that's something that could be done but there are some new kind of coordination risks and um, you can see also in the network you know you can look at the current software running in the network and you can see that there are some quite old versions running still now we don't know if they have value depending on them but it's it's clear that uh, people have not been keeping up to date with versions in some cases so that that may be something to concern us and if we wanted to do a coordinated coordinated upgrade we might need to try and contact every one of those nodes and figure out how to contact them and whether they you know their time frame for upgrading some exercise like that so another interesting topic is whether a fork is opt-in or not so opt-in in the user sense the people that are running the software do they make a conscious decision like do they all have to upgrade so with hard forks because everybody has to upgrade you could view that as user choice yeah. you know every, everybody has to get together and agree and upgrade for the system to upgrade and so the users do have a direct choice so if if some if a proposal was was made for a hard fork that was unpopular it probably wouldn't happen because the users could veto it they could just not upgrade and conversely with a soft fork it's it's kind of more automatic the miners are making the decision effectively or now it's it's indirect in the sense that we expect that miners would only want to make an upgrade if users were in widespread agreement for the upgrade because miners depend on the value of Bitcoin and they want happy and satisfied users so there is an indirect opt-in that if the users really don't like it then the miners are unlikely to do the upgrade but still there's a form of there's a more direct 
uh, decision with the hard fork. Unfortunately, that comes with the cost that it's more complicated to do the upgrade because you have to coordinate with all those people. Now, this next line about uh, SPV or smartphone wallets, whether an upgrade is needed. So, um, with a simple hard fork, that is generally not the case. That you know, an upgrade can happen, and the due to some limitations in the security model, basically of the way smartphone wallets work, it turns out you can increase the block size, and they actually won't notice. They will continue to function with a different block size. Um, with the soft fork, um, users don't have to upgrade smartphone wallets because they continue to function. But and and the transactions are backwards and forwards compatible, but users get advantage by upgrading. Um, now another aspect of software is uh, technical debt or, or sort of built up long running bugs or design defects, which you generally want to uh, fix, because if you don't, you tend to run into problems in software. And we'll talk about that in a bit more. So the soft fork proposal that is being worked on at the moment, uh, the segregated witness proposal, um, includes a number of technical debt fixes, so bug fixes and design fixes that will help a lot of companies and use cases and uh, generally help the state of the software. Now, it's, it's hard to know what uh, features other forks include because it depends what you choose to implement in them. Um, so for a firm fork, and the, the trade-off would be the more fixes you implement, the longer it will take to do the implementation and to do design and testing. And one of the criteria people are using is how quickly can they do the upgrade? So particularly that tends to mean that the simple hard fork has included the minimal possible features. So particularly no technical debt fixes and the minimal workarounds to avoid immediate problems. So uh, that's why I say if, if it's done quickly, then there are no, sorry, only minimal fixes. Um, and that, that has a side effect that the, you know, the problems that are caused by those bugs persist for you know, maybe six months or 12 months more. And the features that rely on those fixes, so Lightning, for example, relies on malleability fixes, they may also get delayed and delay the higher scale opportunity that we were talking about in the requirements of layer two. Um, and in the case of a full hard fork, it's actually the motivation to do technical debt fixes. So typically you wouldn't do a full hard fork unless you really wanted to uh, do some overhaul or data structure reorganization in order to fix uh, bugs or defects. And so it would tend to have fixes in it uh, as an assumption. So this is an interesting question. Um, now you can look at a, a hard fork as a, you know, we were, we were talking about it, it requires everybody to opt in. So you know, almost everybody. So it's a, it's a form of a referendum in a way where you need a near majority, you know, I mean, sorry, almost unanimous uh, support and agreement for it to happen safely. And um, so conversely, soft forks are, you know, we, we hope that miners will take into account the, you know, they, they should only make an upgrade if users want this fe want the feature. But if the feature is uncontroversial, and we'll talk about what might be controversial and not controversial features, um, then it's cheaper to do a soft fork because we've, we've got lots of experience doing them. They can be done quickly, and they don't require as much coordination. Um, so if, if we look at the different, some different kinds of examples of uh, controversial and uncontroversial things, so some of, 
you know, th most of the uh, Bitcoin differentiators that we talked about in a previous slide are things that would that users would be very uh, upset about if they were removed from the system. So, a reduction, a major reduction in privacy, um, an imposition that you require permission to use Bitcoin at all. Um, so things of that nature. I think uh, another one would be increasing the number of coins or something like that. So these these are things that basically no user and no ecosystem company that uses Bitcoin wants to contemplate. So that we never want to do those. Um, on the other end of the spectrum are uh, uncontroversial things. So things that are just you know they preserve all of the interesting features of Bitcoin, but they're just they're just better. They fix limitations. So faster transactions, more scale, cheaper transactions, bug fixes, and so forth. In principle, they should be uncontroversial. And so I think where, where it gets interesting is that there are, unfortunately, trade-offs. And we get situations that arise where um, we would like both, both sides of the trade-off. Uh, and uh, that, that can be difficult to achieve in the short term. So one example that is topical is the scale versus uh, security and permissionless trade-off. Um, I will talk about why, why that trade-off arises in a bit. Um, and uh, cent centralization, the reason centralization can be a problem is at, at the extremes, it, um, it tends to put the properties that make Bitcoin interesting at risk of, er of erosion. So to, to make a simple and extreme example, if all of the Bitcoins ended up being controlled by a single pool or a single miner or a very small number of them, and those, the, there were companies controlling those and those companies were in the US, then, or, or another you know, country, then there would be a risk that that company would be asked to make changes or to impose policy that users would not like. Um, and so we can see that decentralization is actually the, the main technical mechanism that is providing many of the interesting Bitcoin differentiators. Um, so the question then about, um, so this, this is just a question, I'm not sure what the answer is, but it, uh, you know, I think if you'd asked people last year or the year before if they would prefer a hard fork or a referendum for every change or whether they were okay with soft forks, they would have said that hard forks are generally better because they give everybody, all users, the uh, opportunity to opt in. So it, it gives the decision to the users. And I think the kind of slow progress on um, the sort of uh, ongoing discussion about scalability has shown that um, referendums are expensive and have their own controversy. So in the same way that if a country has a referendum, it encourages people um, to want to think about the decision and uh, campaign about it and think about whether it's good or bad for them and, and try to pick an outcome that is advantageous for them. And so if, if we are actually making a change that is uncontroversial, you know, a small increase in scale, for example, maybe you could argue in hindsight that a referendum is um, more expensive than the benefit you get because you know if it's not a, if it's not a, a question that users really care about you know nobody really disagrees that we would like to see a a small increase in scale or some increase in scale then it might be that it's uh, quicker to just do it by soft fork if we use that as a bar so that's a question that people can uh, have different views on so then we were talking about decentralization and this uh, manifests itself with miners and pools. So there's a, there's a problem called the orphan rate, which is 
just that basically because it's a distributed system and miners are running a kind of lottery and winning blocks every 10 minutes, um, and there's a certain amount of time it takes to transmit a block through the network, there is a chance that two miners will create a block at close to the same time, and then one of them will win and one of them will lose, and the person who loses, loses uh, mining revenue. So miners tend to keep a close eye on their orphan rate and monitor it and try to optimize for it. And um, it turns out the limit is, I mean, people assume that this is due to bandwidth. You know, let's say that the bandwidth to some locations is not good and miners are sometimes in remote locations because of access to cheap power or cooling. Um, and so it, it turns out the limit is actually latency and not bandwidth. And that is because the the actual block is transmitted at the at the end, in the last three seconds or so, and so one one megabytes is not much in bandwidth terms. It's actually quite technically difficult to achieve reliable and fair broadcast in three seconds. Meaning that small miners and large miners tend to receive the block in similar time frames. Um, and in in many ways, you're already seeing. Uh, side effects of the broadcast issue. So, and what tends to happen is people use workarounds. So, one thing they do is they use a pool rather than solo mining. So, you have a slush and slushes pool, for example. Uh, if if you were solo mining and you were had slow bandwidth, the solution would be to use a pool and it would do the broadcast for you. And then they can solve that problem for you. Another one is the relay network, which is a, a kind of custom optimized compressed block transfer that can do much better than the peer-to-peer -peer network, both because of the routes that it selects and the network compression. And that was introduced to help medium-sized miners and, and potentially small miners uh, keep up with large miners in terms of uh, block transfer time. So, and large miners have been, you know, um, more able to negotiate peering arrangements with other miners so they can uh, reduce orphan risk in that way. Um, another another th sort of phenomenon that has arisen is the so-called validationless mining. And this is basically uh, where one pool or, mi or miner fetches the um, block proposal from another pool without checking it themselves. So they don't have the data to check it, so they're just accepting on trust that the other person has checked it. And that can sort of cascade problems. If, if a given miner is, did something uh, confusing or inconsistent with network rules, then there can be a sequence of blocks found by other miners that have not been checked. And this actually happened last year with a, a soft fork increase and people didn't realize how widespread validationless mining was. And so for a short period of time until people intervened, the, some incorrect blocks were being mined um, and they had to be canceled. And people actually lost Bitcoins, you know, some miners lost Bitcoins because of this. But um, the reason that people would do validationless mining is it's faster and it reduces orphan rate. So. As far as I know, people are still doing it because it's still worth it overall relative to the loss they made when it went wrong. Um, and there's a, there's a side effect of validationless mining, which is it, it reduces security potentially for uh, SPV wallets, smartphone wallets, because the, the proof of work is sort of an assertion of the transactions being valid. And if a number of miners aren't checking that, something completely invalid could be asserted for more than one block, you know, for a couple of blocks or something. Um, and so then the question is, okay, so if, if we increase the block size and the orphan rate does go up, what's going to happen? Is, is something disadvantageous going to happen? And the, from the evidence of how we see that people have worked around problems today, what we think is going to happen is that um, you know miners are, are pragmatic. They're in business. They're in a business to make a profit. So they're going to use whatever techniques are available to work around the increased orphan rate. And 
the techniques are available are more validation and less mining, more centralized, you know, fewer pools, larger pools, one pool, that would be very extreme. Um, and so we come then to decentralization. So the side effect of all these things is more centralization and further increasing the sort of policy risk that we talked about. So um, we don't always hear so much about decentralization in terms of doing something about it more as a kind of passive problem, but actually it's an ecosystem problem. And I'd argue that if the ecosystem put its mind to it, there are things they could, that could be done to improve decentralization. So first of all, what, what exactly do we mean about decentralization? So there are two main topics. One is the pools we just discussed. Another one is economic nodes. So people who are, you know, some people are using smartphones, some people are running a, a full node that is a more secure mode to run Bitcoin in that provides better protection. So people who are running merchant services or exchanges and high value, you know, vaults and so on tend to run economic nodes. And it's a subtle point that actually the it's not miners that enforce the protocol consensus rules, it's the economic nodes because um, the economic nodes are, are receiving transactions and making decisions based on what their node says. So if, if a user were to receive some coins from a, by running a shop and try to deposit them into an exchange and the exchange is running a full node and the full node says these coins are invalid, then the user hasn't received money. And so that means that if there are a large number of economic nodes, um, it's more important to think about it in terms of a reasonable decentralization. So the nodes are run by power users and small, medium, large sized companies in many different countries. Um, and that a large proportion of the Bitcoin transactions by value are being tested against economic nodes soon, like after not too many peer-to-peer -to -peer hops of payments, then that collective action enforces the network rules. So it's, it is the case that economic nodes are lower than at present. And an analogy for this process of economic nodes would be um, counterfeit testing equipment. So some shops have uh, equipment that they pass banknotes through to check if they're forgeries or not. And so the distributed collection of those counterfeit detectors is actually providing integrity for the money supply, even though it's you know run by the, the shops for their own self-interest, for their own security, it actually provides uh, currency integrity for everybody. And so you get a similar effect from economic nodes. And unfortunately, the number of economic nodes is, is decreasing for a few reasons. Mostly, I, I think, because um, the, there are uh, services that have started outsourcing full nodes. So they'll run a full node for you. And in some ways, this is a good thing because they're more specialized and they know how to run them securely. But in other ways, it's a bad thing because there are now fewer companies that are operating full nodes. And so there is more risk that, that if this number of full nodes falls too far, that they could have uh, policy decisions imposed on them that are uh, undesirable from the user's perspective. And if, if we let too many undesirable for user side effects uh, creep into Bitcoin, then users will become disenfranchised and go use a different technology, like paper cash or some other technology. Um, so it's in, it's in the ecosystem's interest to uh, retain the uh, differentiating properties of Bitcoin, because that's what, that's what we think attracts users to Bitcoin. So we should all want to protect those properties. Now, um, because both mining is quite centralized and economic nodes are becoming a little more centralized, it makes it uh, difficult to do large increases in uh, block sizes um, for the reasons we just went through. Now, 
In terms of the side effects, so Bitfury did some analysis to say what percentage of nodes they thought would disconnect and stop running nodes if, if the block size reached different levels. And so if, if the uh, decentralization metrics of the network were quite strong, as they were maybe in 2013, and we increased the block size quite a bit, and you know, 10% of the no nodes dropped off, or 20%, it, it wouldn't really be a problem because you know, there's still plenty of decentralization left, and we're still quite sure that the properties of the network are going to be protected. Um, the other interesting thing is that if uh, there are the two metrics of decentralization, if one of them was strong and the other one weak, we could probably work with that. But uh, so, you know, if, if we had very decentralized mining but not many full nodes, we could probably work with that because the miners are, you know, sort of patching over the decentralization problem or vice versa. Um, so, and you know, the, the, I think it's not always articulated clearly that we could, you know, be more relaxed about changing the block size and so forth if decentralization were fixed, but that's been discussed in a passive sense. But I think really it's fundamental that we should uh, attack this in an active sense, that the ecosystem should coordinate. So we've talked about the ecosystem coordinating to do a hard fork if that became necessary. So we should think about the ecosystem coordinating to address this kind of uh, bad configuration that the network has slipped into. And so there are a number of things that you know power users and companies can do. So we can buy some miners, you know, even a, a few terahash if that's all spread around and power users are running a bigger percentage of the network. That helps. Um, ecosystem companies that are not professional miners, but they are, you know, doing payment processing or exchange or vault services or other user services, they could also buy a small uh, percentage of mining to improve decentralization. And their reason for doing that would be because their business depends on scale and that indirectly depends on decentralization. Um, and their business also depends on Bitcoin retaining the properties that users want and want to buy services based on. Um, the other thing you can do is mine on smaller pools first. So for whatever reason, people have um, tended to, you know, it's, it's moved around over time where, you know, one pool has been big for a while and then it's shrunk and another one has taken over. But people have just faced with a, an arbitrary decision, there's a kind of user interface problem, if faced with an arbitrary decision where you don't know, you might tend to pick the one that looks biggest, you know, with the assumption that it's popular, it must be good, other people must have validated it. And so it's a safe choice, but that actually, hurts the uh, security of the network. So people should mine on smaller pools first to average out the uh, pool size and also smaller cloud mining if you're buying cloud mining. Um, and another problem is access to ASICs. I think there are only maybe three or four companies actually directly selling ASICs at the moment. There were, there were more a few years ago. Um, some of them have been consolidated or gone out of business um, due to various failures. Uh, most, mostly failure to execute, like, to deliver working ASICs on time, as it's very time sensitive. So uh, we, could, we could, the ecosystem could encourage manufacturers to sell ASICs to power users and to smaller businesses. Um, right now, it tends to be sort of bulk discounted, maybe sold in bulk to mining farms or maybe only self-mined and not available for sale at all. Um, another problem is that there are economies of scale, so people running professional mining farms get uh, you know, cheaper power because they can choose their location. Um, residential power is usually more expensive. And they can also bulk discount and get cheaper ASICs and maybe be able to buy ASICs where the manufacturers uh, don't go to the trouble of selling small amounts. So as, as a company, if you're selling you know, one or two miners per customer, that's a cost to you. Now you have to employ people to handle support calls and deal with questions from people maybe who are learning to mine for the first time. So there's, there's a cost that companies might choose to avoid. Um, so, you know, we, we could encourage miners to sell them. And again, this is self-interested because if miners let uh, 
centralization build up it, and it erodes the interesting properties of Bitcoin, then Bitcoins will become less valuable, users will leave, and they will have ASICs that they can't sell for as much money. Um, and ASICs are actually very sensitive to uh, price fluctuations. You know, if you, you have, to have an ASIC and, uh, and the price goes down significantly, it, it can be the difference between profit and loss. Um, particularly if you're pay, if you pay a lot for the ASIC and if you don't have discount, or um, if you uh, are paying above average for electricity. Um, something else hypothetically that could be done would be a kind of not-for-profit open spec ASIC that kind of provides baseline availability for power users so that everybody can get some amount of ASICs uh, at a reasonably cost-effective price. Um, and so I'd argue that this is an important problem for Bitcoin's success and it uh, is the one of the big drivers behind current scale limitations and retaining Bitcoin's differentiating properties. So a brief uh, technical detour into soft forks and how you could increase, how you can increase scale using soft forks. So uh, I, th I think there was a time where people were thinking that you couldn't increase the block size um, via soft fork. Uh, there's a particular mechanism where a soft fork can only restrict rules and not increase rules. So it was it was counterintuitive that you would be able to increase block size via soft fork, but it turns out to be possible and. The segregated witness proposal, which is the current uh, soft fork that's being discussed, um, uses that property. And the way it works is that a average Bitcoin transaction is about 60% of the size is signatures, and the other 40% is the transaction information. And what the soft fork does is it stores the signatures separately in a, in a witness area from the basic transaction. And then the one megabyte limit only applies to the basic transaction, excluding the witness data. And as it's 40%, in principle, that would allow up to 2.5 times increasing block size via a soft fork. But for various technical reasons, this uh, soft fork um, ends up providing maybe 1.8 to 2 times, uh, depending on the types of signatures. So you know there are multi-signatures that are bigger and single signatures that are smaller and so forth. Um, so the interesting observations there are that soft fork, it turns out you can do many more things with soft forks than people have been assuming a couple of years ago. So that's another, an example of new things that have been discovered about Bitcoin protocol. Um, and actually you can, in principle, though you know, there's a discussion to be had about whether it would be a good approach or not, in principle you could increase the block size beyond this method. Uh, beyond the segregated witness, which is a kind of one-off mechanism. We can't, we can't repeat this to get more scale, but we, there is another type of uh, block size increase via soft fork that in principle uh, works and is uh, not too inelegant, in fact. Um, so we talked earlier about uh, software engineering and technical debt. So it's, for people who've done software and programming and so forth, it's a well-known and sometimes hard-learned experience that people have lived through directly that if you don't write down technical debt, i.e. fix bugs and design defects incrementally so that each version of the software you're putting out tries to fix some prop bugs in the previous version or improve the design that you've discovered uh, organically through use to improve it for the future, if, if you don't do that, problems start to happen. And what tends to happen is that you, if, if you don't do that, um, it over time creates complexity. And it's because people will put a workaround in that has all kinds of limitations and arbitrary behaviors. And then if you do it again, there will be even more complexity because you have a workaround on top of a workaround. And it's, it's a common problem in software engineering because uh, sometimes, um, let's say the the management of a software project may not themselves be technical or may feel commercial pressures and demand that the bugs be deferred to next release like you know the bugs are not showstoppers 
they want to stop the product from working, we should do it next release. And the danger there is that that happens repeatedly. And people who've lived through that in software companies know, probably know what I'm talking about, that that tends to actually be counterproductive after a while, that the software becomes more and more complex and slower to develop and harder to add new features so that it actually ends up costing more and in making the software less reliable. Um, so there are a number of uh, technical debt items, and if on the Bitcoin wiki there's a, a page called the Hard Fork Wishlist, which has a large number of uh, known issues, some of which are very simple, but it's, it, Bitcoin has a very strict backwards compatibility requirement, so it can be something that should, in principle, be easy to implement, can take a while until it gets uh, deployed. And so the segregated witness uh, implementation comes with a quite wide set of uh, technical debt fixes, which many companies are quite excited to see fixed. Uh, so the primary one, which is how this feature f arose, and then the other ones are either necessary or add-ons to make use of a, you know, to do the technical debt write down. Um, malleability, um, which is designed a long, long-standing design defect, and needs to be fixed for Lightning to work and for many other use cases that affect uh, some kinds of payment processes and so on. So that's the primary fix. Another another type of fix is the signature on the value. Uh, so it's just a small design defect that creates complexity problems for hardware wallets. So Slush is a Trezor wallet. Probably you can confirm there was quite a lot of work related to the fact that this wasn't fixed, <laughs> and uh, you know maybe you could have had uh, a different interface or uh, a lower-powered CPU and reduce the cost of the technology, reduce the price of it, re reduce the complexity. If not for that, simple to fix problem. So here, finally, the problem gets fixed, and uh, lots of people will be very happy about that. Um, another problem is so some of these problems are actually related to scaling. So. You know, as, as we're talking about scaling, we should want to improve scaling and write down technical debt that frustrates scaling. And so one of them is the hashing problem. So the ON squared hashing problem gets fixed. Another more simple problem is change buildup. So um, this is kind of analogous to the way some people handle physical cash. They'll withdraw some notes from an ATM and they'll spend it and they'll end up with a pocket full of change and they'll just throw it in a jar and they'll keep doing it. And before long, they have a full jar full of change. And so Bitcoin wallets have a, a sort of design defect that makes that the optimal thing to do. Um, it's because it's cheaper to split a note than to combine change in Bitcoin. So even if they have change that could be used up, the wallet will automatically choose to split a new coin. And that's actually a scaling problem because the, the ledger gets bigger. All, all these coins have to be individually tracked, and that creates a scaling problem because the, the ledger has to be indexed. So you need more storage, more memory, more CPU probably. And it also increases the minimum footprint, so the minimum specification of a full node that can exist on the network because the UTXO is, is larger than it needs to be. So um, people who have been following the technical discussions may have heard about a so-called discount for the witness or signatures. And that is the adjustment factor to correct for the change buildup. So it makes change, it makes spending change and splitting coins into change approximately the same cost so that wallets won't have that perverse incentive anymore. Um, there's also a fix, so in, in the Satoshi white paper there is a, a, this concept of fraud proofs are discussed, but there were some limits that prevent them actually being built. So the, this includes also the minimum fix to allow fraud proofs, though it doesn't include the, you know, the higher level functionality to make use of it. That's something that can happen in a later version, but at least the first part of it gets done. And Another thing it introduces is a more security assurable script extension, uh, which enables Schnorr signatures, which we'll talk about, and are also interesting for scaling. And this is important because whenever uh, 
the developers look to make a, uh, a change to Bitcoin, they have to provide high assurance that there are no security defects that slipped in. And this type of uh, script extension mechanism is much simpler to assure the correctness of um, than the existing mechanism. Um, so, at the beginning we were, so this is coming full circle back to the requirements at the beginning. So I was saying that these are the requirements, the what if requirements that we we're talking about. So to uh, double the transactions per second for three years in a row um, and in parallel have a lightning scale. So this is a, a sketch of um, a sequence of upgrades which should be able to easily achieve that uh, throughput. And this is my opinion because, you know, things can be done in a different sequence or uh, different developers might think that, you know, IBLT should happen before Schnorr or should happen in parallel or afterwards and so forth. So these kind of details will get worked out, but this is my kind of uh, sketch, which I think is reasonably realistic of what we could do with Bitcoin scaling uh, using the uh, scalability roadmap as an outline. Um, so if, if we start with the segregated witness soft fork, we can get approximately two megabytes as wallets and companies opt in, and that's in a, a late stage testing. So I think the last uh, test net before uh, production is, is running right now, is version four of the segregated witness test net. Um, so that should be relatively soon if, if uh, you know, if the ecosystem um, wants to activate it and opt in and uh, start adopting it to achieve scale and the other, other fixes that it comes with. So another thing that we can do fairly soon after that is another, uh, using the script extension I mentioned on a previous slide, um, which is we can get an uh, interesting kind of scale, which is we can make the transactions smaller. So from the same block size, we can get more transactions. If we use this different type of signature, a special property of it, we can achieve between 1.5 and two times more transactions per block. So you know, the actual physical block size sent over the network could still be two megabytes, but the equivalent throughput it would achieve as a three or four megabyte using the old signature type. So the Schnorr uh, signature mechanism is already implemented in um, the libsecp uh, signature library that Bitcoin uses. And the mechanism to deploy that is included in the segregated witness. So this is relatively close technology. There are not too many unknowns about how to do this. So we could potentially see that later this year. Um, which would even deliver ahead of schedule, you know, um, scale, assuming, of course, that people opt in and adopt it. Um, something else to say about the opt-in and adoption of segregated witness is that it provides scale to those people who opt in. Um, so, you know, if I'm running a payment processor and I uh, upgrade the library that I'm using and, you know, uh, move to the new types of addresses, which are backwards compatible, but you know, change the addresses, then I get cheaper transactions or access to more scale. And it's interesting also that people who don't upgrade also get access to scale because the people who have upgraded leave empty space in the base block so that that can uh, be used by people who haven't upgraded. So it does uh, support quite well incremental scaling where you know we wouldn't expect to see two megabytes of transactions instantly we would see that build up over time as people opt in and as the new space left by people opting in is used by new users coming in or existing users who haven't upgraded their wallets creating new transactions hopefully new users coming in will immediately move to wallets that are already upgraded as well so as we add new users, we should see more adoption. Um, so we were talking about the orphan problem and how that is a quite significant problem for mining. And it turns out that there is an interesting technical solution to this to 
convert what is currently a latency problem into a sort of a latency bottleneck into a bandwidth bottleneck. And the network actually has excess bandwidth. You know, the network being the the physical networks and transport mechanisms between miners and pools, mostly. As full nodes are not so full nodes that are not mining are not so sensitive to how quickly they receive the blocks. They don't need to receive it in three seconds, ten seconds will probably do it for them. So um, the IBLT in weak blocks has uh, the property of um, allowing us to then push the network harder because we can use up the excess bandwidth that's currently going unused. So once, you know, assuming that that happens next and the weak blocks in IBLT goes live, then we would be in a position to make use of that excess bandwidth now because we don't have to worry about orphan problems anymore. And so we could look to see a further increase um, to make use of that extra bandwidth. And that could be with a hard fork, a simple hard fork planned ahead, or uh, it, c it could potentially be with a soft fork, but I think a hard fork would be more likely. And um, another potential is uh, a, a kind of flexible size, so, so a, a block size that can grow over time automatically, um, maybe reacting to um, demand in some way. And that, that's what the uh, FlexCap kind of outline proposal does. So it's possible that that would happen next or that a simpler uh, a block size change would happen next. And that should deliver you know, another two times. So we can see that with these three changes, we get to the scale that was talked about um, in the uh, requirements section at the beginning. Um, then we can talk about the uh, layer two or lightning. And so that, that can happen in parallel. So it's not you know kind of waiting or deferring. There are different people working in different teams um, developing lightning today. I think there are four or five companies working on it. Uh, most of it's open source. There are mailing lists and discussion forums where you can look at it and look at the code in GitHub. Um, and the 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 one requirement is it needs you know it needs some of the technical fixes in segregated witness or those fixes could be deployed in other ways too so it really needs the malleability fix and it needs uh, uh, check lock time which has already been upgraded um, previously and it needs uh, I ideally needs CSV which is in the process of being upgraded now uh, separately from segregated witness. Um, and so basically the the existing segregated witness testnet is now being used by people working on Lightning because it provides everything they need. So once that goes live, there'll be no kind of a network feature uh, missing, no network features missing that would prevent Lightning. So that's quite an exciting progress. And in terms of um, Lightning, the estimates are, you know, they vary and it depends on how uh, the usage pattern works out. But there are estimates which are off a quite dramatic scale, maybe 100 to 10,000 times more transactions compared to on-chain transactions. And it, it sh it's important to point out that Lightning transactions are actually real native Bitcoin transactions. And each and every Lightning transaction could be posted to the Bitcoin chain and is a valid transaction. It's just that there is a caching mechanism that collapses them uh, so that they don't all need to be sent to the chain. And you can think of that loosely as a kind of uh, right coalescing disk cache or something like that. Um, now, what could we do with this huge amount of scale? So apart from um, seeing user adoption grow and for retail, and we might see new types of transactions, sorry, new types of use cases like micropayments or very low money, low value payments bring in new, um, so for example, um, sending a small amount of Bitcoin with a email, or some people have talked about uh, using this with, instead of um, ad blockers, so that you could pay the website a tiny amount of payment per page view and that would maybe provide them 
with a better source of revenue and less frustration for the users as well. Um, and something like Lightning may be able to provide the scale to support something at that, at that size. Um, the other really interesting and important property of Lightning is that it provides uh, instant and secure final confirmation of transactions. So one of the problems that people have with um, Bitcoin payments is that technically you should wait until the first confirmation, which is about 10 minutes, and that's far too slow for retail payments. And so there's a small chance of uh, you know somebody accepting a payment and then not getting paid and that kind of thing. Um, so Lightning is able to provide a very secure and instant confirmation, which is great for re that, that retail problem as well. So that's it. So time for questions. So uh, thank you, thank you a lot, Adam, for your comprehensive and interest, interesting presentation about Bitcoin scaling issues. I see in the audience a lot of important and core Bitcoin people from Czech and Slovak Bitcoin community. So I think these people can wait for a question to you. So any questions? <laughs> Don't hesitate. Uh, I have a question, of course. Uh, hello, Adam. Thank you Hi. for coming. Uh, your presentation was quite technical, uh, but my question is completely untechnical or more uh, from the uh, social, social part. Uh, you were involved in Bitcoin from the very beginning. You were the, maybe the, one of the first person interacting with Satoshi Nakamoto. But I heard that you really started to believe in Bitcoins during, in, I don't know, 2013, mm -hmm. where you bought your first Bitcoins for real. Mm -hmm. How could this happen? <laughs> uh, I, I guess I, um, I'm happy to like, think about the technical protocols, and other people are more practical and like to try, to try the software out and things like that. And so I was more uh, how Finney was trying out Bitcoin, maybe one of the first people to try it out and write a kind of report on how it worked and so on. So I was content to re read the report and think, well, that's, that's very cool. Um, and also, for some reason, it seemed to me that it was uncertain if this would bootstrap. And so I was kind of uh, taking a wait and see approach. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, uh, different people saw the potential earlier or later, or, you know, just just tried it out and kept some coins. And so, yeah, that's, that's how that happened. Uh, yes, this is very contrary to a lot of people think that anybody who was in the beginning clearly saw that Bitcoin will prevail and rise. Yeah. Uh, and uh, f for example, me, I was uh, I was like really switching to Bitcoin really fast, but this is only because I didn't see the past where a lot of uh, trials uh, failed. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Maria, and I'm relative new to this topic. And I wanted to make two questions. I read before that Bitcoins can be stolen. And what about someone like uh, send your virus over internet? Is that even possible? That's the first question. And the second question is, Let's say with money, with the paper that we actually have, with this system, people make illegal ways to make money, right? Like money laundry and so on and so on. Is there a legal way to make bitcoins? Um, so, uh, so, sorry, can you repeat the first question again? Well, the first question 
Mm. Or the second one? First one. Okay, I read that bitcoins can't be stolen. Okay, okay, right. So the theft problem. So uh, bitcoins are very interesting, but uh, irreversible and binary. So <laughs> um, it's relatively unforgiving, you know, in the sense that it stresses computer security. And so for the average Windows machine, it could be quite dangerous to put uh, any, any kind of large amount of Bitcoin on it. You know, maybe you only want to put $10, $20 or something that you would feel okay losing. And you know, if you did lose it, at least you'd know you had a virus and you needed to reinstall the machine or something. But for any kind of uh, higher security applications, um, really people should be using hardware wallets like the Trezor or uh, smartphones that they don't install too many not very well vouched for software on. Uh, even smartphones can have things stolen potentially. Um, and you can also potentially use um, sort of uh, trustless vaults. So they're a sort of multi-signature mechanism where you can sort of work with a provider that helps you obtain security, um, sort of makes it more convenient, but can place some limits. So you know, there are some services that would prevent you spending more than $100 a day. Um, but still leave you in control of your Bitcoins. So that could sort of protect you from theft because you can set rules about how you would spend money. So your second question was about um, uh, sort of illegal uses of Bitcoin. So I guess one thing to say about that is Bitcoin is, you know, it has some privacy, but it's not great privacy. In fact, all the transactions can be uh, followed on the network. You can see, you can follow the trail. The entire ledger is public. And you can see, for example, in the there's a second trial related to the Silk Road trial where two of the uh, FBI and DEA sort of law enforcement people uh, got greedy and stole some of the Silk Road bitcoins. And um, the there was a presentation recently by one of the sort of I guess internal investigation team investigating corrupt law enforcement agents was able to trace all their transactions and conclude how many transactions they took and that it really was them. So in some ways, um, Bitcoin is, you know, a hot, more traceable than other forms of payment. So for example, it's, uh, you know, physical paper cash is certainly more attractive these days. And also there's a volume question, you know, there is far more uh, crime and illegal and gray market transactions going on in the world than uh, the entire value of Bitcoin by a big order of magnitude. So you know, I think people, you know, if people want to uh, focus on uh, reducing crime, currently there are other areas where it's much more productive to focus. Okay, I have a question here. Uh, I have a question about Hashcash. So, uh, have you thought about uh, this idea some further for combating these asymmetric problems like DDoS attacks and mm -hmm. um, that it's very easy to send traffic to a website but it's difficult to consume? And I think the, the hash cache idea is really nice. I've implemented something like that in an anti-DDoS proxy. But I think that the, the idea is kind of froze, and uh, I, I'm wondering if you have any new thoughts about um, that or some new development thinking. So, I mean, there, there were a few attempts to use it for that. And so, so you, you tried some things, and um, there was somebody using it for, um, to deter click fraud. So where people are receiving money per advertisement click. So what they would do is they would cause the browser to mine hash cash on the CPU um, and only count the click if that actually happened. And there's a WordPress plugin that does something similar um, for sort of to deter, I think in that case, sort of abusive uh, blog spam, which is trying to artificially increase search engine rankings by pasting links everywhere. Um, and another idea was a more dynamic behavior. 
So there was, a, I think, an internet draft um, by some people at Cisco some years ago where they proposed that you would connect to a web server, and if the web server was under load, it would request some work, and if it was under heavy load, it would request more work. And the net effect would be, you know, if, if the web server would have crashed anyway, well, now some people can get through, but only the people with the plugin or the hardware or what have you. So, you know, while it's discriminatory that the person with the plugin or the person with the most powerful computer gets to use the service, at least somebody gets service, where the alternative is the service is down. So you could argue it's a, a net win. Now, uh, prob uh, there's 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 a very old like RFC like document. It, if you look for like I don't know ITF draft hash cache or something, you, uh, I've got um, the name of the person who was the primary author. Um, I mean I don't know if it was used in in anger. The the other things that it, it was used for is um, anti spam. So spam assassin actually respects hash cache uh, postage stamps and the Microsoft Mail Suite, so Outlook, Exchange, Hotmail, they have their own hash cache, it's, it's hash cache, but with a different format, uh, so it's not compatible, but they, they implemented that uh, as an anti-spam mechanism within that ecosystem. Um, it's called, I think it's called Postmark, and they released it as an open specification, so anybody can implement it in theory. I, th I think only Microsoft implemented it, though. Um, so the other problem with, with hash cash is uh, people make ASICs, it seems. <laughs> so it occurred to me when I was designing it that, you know, if this was what widely successful, um, people would make custom hardware to do it. You know, spammers would make custom hardware to overcome the system problems. And so I was supposing that if it were widely adopted, that individuals should have ASICs too to keep the playing field level so that you would have like a... You know, uh, that can help. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, that that's a, a related topic for Bitcoin. So some people wonder about um, if, in the very long term, we should consider, with a lot of notice, like three years' notice, changing the hash function in some way, um, and I think, or, or changing it. I think there are some coins or proposals that say, well, let's change the hash function every six months. Uh, and that maybe that would solve, that would prevent or deter ASICs. But I think it, it wouldn't actually ultimately solve the problem because it's a universal rule of software that hardware wins. <laughs> so um, basically people would look at the catalog of hash functions and look at common properties of them and make things that accelerate them or you know, make optimized FPGAs or gener uh, GPUs that are optimized for that purpose, like without the graphics I.O. and all that stuff. Um, so ultimately, specialized hardware always wins, even if the problem is dynamic, because the space, is, the space of what techniques you're going to use are somewhat constrained as well. And the other problem with making the hash function more complicated is that it will um, make it harder to make ASICs. So you see that with S-Crypt, right? There finally was an S-Crypt ASIC, but I think only one or two people made them. Because it was an ugly, you know, complicated thing with memory, and it's, it's not convenient to put memory in the same kind of ASIC technology. So in many ways, I think we're, it's best to have a very simple function. And um, obviously, it's part of the social contract as well that to change the hash function would be very controversial, right? Um. Mm, I just want to add a little bit to what you have been saying, that uh, it's possible to not change just the hash function, but the problem itself, especially when uh, you have a website. Website can give you a problem in with, in a form of JavaScript program, mm -hmm. and if, if, if and if you if if you solve it, then, then you are done. And if an attacker is able to create a, some ASIC that is able to solve all the problems, then it's profit anyway. So well, I mean, I guess you could say. I mean, I, th I think. The, the general, you know, the general fast problem solver for proof of work is something like a GPU, or there's a company making 
uh, CPUs that are sort of like a, a very high core count, very simple risk processor with like a thousand cores in a chip or something. And those kinds of things are, you know, maybe their single threaded performance is quite weak, but they have a much higher execution throughput than a conventional CPU. And the other thing you can do with ASICs is ASICs are, um, I mean, with mining, is mining is error, you know, fault tolerant. If you, if you make a general purpose CPU, you need some huge number of nines, like six or seven nines reliability or whatever it is. And for an ASIC, you know, a couple of nines would do fine. Um, even one nine at the extreme, maybe. So you could get one of those kind of CPUs and, you know, push it to the limit and um, then use it for general purpose. Uh, execution with a JIT compiler for whatever language the web server is sending you and still get like a pretty decent advantage over a conventional user. Um, I mean, it's, the, the problem is it's very difficult to get a, a uh, you know, it, it doesn't take a very strong advantage to break things. So ASICs are Presumably, you know, thousands or tens of thousands times faster than GPUs and so on, more than CPUs. So there's a huge advantage. But you know, even if the advantage from the sort of somewhat customized hardware solution is 50%, it's probably broken, right? Economically, um, it doesn't take much of an advantage for a miner to take all the money. I mean, to to win all of the mining output or most of it. So it's very challenging to to make a fair algorithm, even, even with complete algorithm agility. It just pushes the hardware design in a different direction, which is more complicated. I have a question on the IBLT and weak blocks. Uh, we operate slash pool also in China, and for us, uh, it's both. It's latency and the bandwidth problem. Interesting. So because of the great firewall of China. Uh, so I can imagine a scenario where you actually can build the block on the other end of the world, but you're still missing the transactions that are stuck in China. So I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, the, the solution is probably to, to get rid of China or to, so that they don't have the majority. But, um, um, actually, it's hard the, to do. Yeah, I mean, actually, it's interesting that the, the uh, I mean, so you, you have a node in China. That's uh, the right thing to do. Because two nodes, because uh, the interesting observation is that to the extent that there is a bandwidth, a lower bandwidth situation in China or higher latency, that is actually, because China has more than 50%, that's actually the problem of people outside China, not, not China's problem. <laughs> and people misunderstand that sometimes. So, so then you were saying that you uh, were concerned that about bandwidth. So, so there are things, separate things to do about bandwidth. It's, it's not on here, but there are a number of proposals about um, compressing blocks. So the, the weak blocks, well, sorry, the IBLT part significantly compresses, you know, asymptotically by a factor of two in the sense that the naive peer-to-peer -peer protocol sends all the transactions across the network and then sends them all again in a block. So with IBLT, you, you basically send them once, and then you send some very compact list of which transactions, something like, you know, these are the transactions I'm using, and that can fit in, you know, like a couple of TCP packets or something. Um, and that's what you see with the relay network. It's able to uh, convey information about how to construct the block in a tiny amount of data, like in a in single TCP packet, basically, a high proportion of the time. So there's, there's a small bandwidth saving. Um, and you know, I think there's there's not that much more bandwidth saving you can do essentially because you've got to receive a transaction, and you know, if you if you get down from 200% to 105 or 101%, you know, the 1% isn't going to make the difference. The transactions exist, and you can't you know compress them any further. Um, so the the other things that can be done for um, people who are trying to run nodes in constrained bandwidth situations is to turn off relaying. So it turns out relaying is using the majority of the bandwidth. I'm not sure the fact it might be like eight times, or, you know, eight, uh, like 80% of the bandwidth being used is, um, is actually relaying transactions to other people. So you can, you can be a leech on a peer-to-peer -peer network, just receive the transactions and not relay them. That would conserve bandwidth. 
quite effectively. It's n it's not giving back to the network, but maybe it's better for people in a high bandwidth to provide the relay. Um, so, and I think it's important that uh, blocks be constructed. You know, we one sometimes when people talk about bandwidth constraints in China or something, they will say, well, okay, but they can just rent, uh, you know, rent a server in Singapore or somewhere which has high bandwidth, at low cost, and is relatively close, um, and that will solve the problem. But it's, it's another form of centralization in that what makes Bitcoin have the properties it does of, you know, policy neutrality and permissionlessness is that there are too many jurisdictions involved to easily and effectively impose policy and so what you you know even if there were policy being imposed locally because there are many jurisdictions um, you know what there might be some things that are blocked in Singapore that are not blocked in China and if China is you know no longer constructing its own local blocks we lose that diversity of policy um, so anyway it's interesting to know that you've gone to the step of uh, obtaining a node in China I don't think many people have done that but it's a good yeah. So the, the the relay network is doing some very odd things with routing, and so sometimes, and I guess this is why you have nodes, so you're probably doing the same thing, is you might think, well, okay, let's route it over the internet, and it will get through the shortest route. But actually, like the relay network, you know, I think Matt has rented uh, VPSs in very strange places, which uh, achieve a shorter route than you can achieve in other ways, and so it's sort of manual routing. Like, trying VPSs in different places and uh, finding out what works best. Connection from Singapore to Europe usually goes through uh, Japan, Hawaii, the US. So it's probably better to have a node in Japan than in Singapore. Mm. Okay. Um, yes. I have a question about um, the hard fork which happened like uh, in the beginning of the year, if I or some month ago, uh, about your your take on this. What do you think about uh, this? You know, hard fork by Bitcoin Bitcoin Classic team, and do you think it will um, happen again in the f future? How do you prevent this? Is it preventable? And so it brings another question, more ma more philosophical. Like, um, is decentralization attainable? Is it not utopic? Because when you take something like the Unix, uh, Linux kernel, it's open source. Everybody can add new features and so on, but um, you still have one guy managing the stuff. So for Bitcoin, is it, isn't it like a, mi a mistake not to have like one person deciding? Um, yeah, the second question first. Um, I think the the counter argument has been that uh, if 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 you if you apply it to yourself and imagine that you have like you know uh, decision making power about what features go into Bitcoin. Now, I think you would I I would feel scared to be in that position because there are maybe over time powerful forces like governments or you know that would like to change the properties and so you can see perhaps uh, a preview of what can happen in the ripple the company was uh, asked to make changes to the ripple protocol which probably would not have been popular with their users but they were in central control and they were asked to make them so um in the same way that we have decentralization in the network to um, achieve neutrality and, and keep primary the features that users value, uh, maybe having you know uh, developers in different countries working for different companies or independent, all having to agree or you know a, a good proportion of having to agree is um, a maybe more robust way to 
keep the system independent and retaining features that users like. You know, we're, we're looking at a snapshot in time. We have to wonder about what happens in the future as maybe uh, companies or governments want to influence the protocol decisions. Um, whether, whether the user's interests might be lost, and that, that would be problematic. I think if too many user features were lost, Bitcoin would lose its value. And so for that reason, it should be in the company's interest to the current ecosystem, Bitcoin company's interest, to see the user's desired features retained. Um, but it's, uh, it's complex. So then you, then you were, previous question, uh, talking about hard forks. So I think, uh, I had put up a slide about, so I think hard forks, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's just a question about trade-offs. So there are different ways to do upgrades and they have advantages and disadvantages. So it's, it's possible for you know, different ecosystem companies to have different views because maybe they specialize in a different area of business. Right? So like a miner might prefer one type of feature, payment processor might prefer another, users, you know, might not like either of those features. Um, and so I think what you're seeing is people having different preferences. And I think in some sense it ties back to, um, just pull it back, this, uh, what, what are Bitcoin's differentiators? So, you know, if, pe if, if uh, not everybody necessarily fully agrees on the properties that are desirable, or they may all like the properties but place them in a different order. And so if you, if you make different assumptions um, about what's important, you can result, you can end up with different conclusions. So, um, so, you know, I think that one of the debates is, the, is how fast you can do a hard fork. So on here, I've put the uh, simple hard fork, which is the BIP109 that you're referring to, I think. Um, and in my view, and I think quite a lot of people's view, the, there's a trade-off where if you do it very quickly, I mean, the faster you do it, the more risky it is. If you did it tomorrow, very bad things would happen. If you did it in a month, it might be a bit rushed in order to see everybody upgrade, and there are risks for people who haven't upgraded. Um, and it requires a lot of coordination, which, which the Bitcoin network and the ecosystem hasn't tried to do before, which is just you know, partly a human contact. How do, how do I call up this person? How do I reach this node over here? I don't know who's running it, but a service is running it. It's accepting Bitcoin. So it can take time to find out who's running a node. And you know, there are even Bitcoin services that are running that um, are economically active, but not maintained. It happens. Uh, you know, I think there's a story that there was a, a pool that was still running that had a few petahash of hash rate and was mining invalid blocks for a couple of months. So evidently there were people with miners pointing at the pool that weren't checking whether they were receiving any shares as a result. And there have also been cases of um, pools that had kind of become defunct, like nobody was maintaining them. And they still had some reasonable amount of hash rate, but they hadn't paid out in like months. And um, you know, it was even started to be listed on a, a pool comparison site as having a 100% fee because it doesn't pay out. And yet the hash rate still continued. So you know, it's, it's not exactly, it's a little bit of a tricky environment to, to do strict planning in because in a sort of top-down managed network like the telephone networks or Vodafone or something, there are, you know, reporting and responsibilities and they know who to contact and the people they contact will, you know, uh, cooperate and collaborate to achieve that. But in Bitcoin, it's, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network fundamentally. And so it's difficult sometimes to reach or identify people. And it's actually in many ways a feature of Bitcoin that um, some components of it be possible without identity. So it's, it's good that miners can be uh, permission, mining can be permissionless too and not necessarily identify the miner because that makes it harder to apply uh, policy uh, requests to the miner. Um, so, but that also makes it difficult to contact the miner if, if they're mining invalid blocks or you need them to upgrade or something like that. So it's, it's a trade-off and 
you know, it's a gray area. Um, depends how optimistic you are. Depends, you know, uh, how important immediate higher scale is to you. If it's extremely important, maybe you're willing to take the risk, but maybe some other users who are using it for investment are not so happy about that risk. So it's, I think it's more a question of, you know, different users and ecosystem types of ecosystem companies having slight, slightly conflicting views and preferences. Um, so we'll, we'll see how it plays out, but, um, you know, ult ultimately, the, for the network to upgrade and to scale, it needs people to work together. You know, basically, no, no technology or no upgrade mechanism is going to work if people don't work together to make it work. So it's up to, it's up to the ecosystem and the users, really. You know? I mean, you know, to go back to the developers, and at the end of the day, developers are writing software. And if nobody runs the software they're writing, then um, that, that kind of shows that decision is ultimately the users, because the users choose which software to run. The economic nodes are making their choice about which software to run. And as, as I mentioned briefly, the, uh, the economic nodes control the consensus rules in the network. So the miners have to follow the economic views of the network of users. Um, so there's no, there's no kind of uh, hard and fast answer, but I'm hopeful that uh, Bitcoin will scale. And I gave on the last slide my sketch about what I think will happen. Um, but we'll see. It, it really depends on the companies collectively and on the users and what, uh, what software they choose to run and whether miners choose to activate you know, one method or another. OK, if, if I can have a question. Uh, I will ask about something that uh, some, some people that propose the hard forks and that propose uh, bigger blocks are saying, and that's that the, the soft works are inherently insecure because, uh, because like the, for example, in the SegWit, uh, the, the, the new version is like lying to the old version about what what's is in the blocks and, and like, it, it, it's saying, okay, this is not a transaction when it's not a trans, like, yep. yeah. And so the old, older versions cannot, cannot verify it correctly and so on. Yes, um, so this is uh, a, a, an, an argument that has been made. So I think it's, um, it's, it's not a very good argument in the sense that it's, it's not a new observation. So all uh, Bitcoin protocol upgrade, all planned Bitcoin protocol upgrades so far have been soft forks, and they all have the exact same problem. And nobody was complaining through the last X protocol upgrades. Now, it's true that, you know, so it depends what kind of node you're running as to whether you're at increased risk. And if you're running a smartphone client, it basically doesn't matter because you are trusting the miners anyway in that, because you're not checking enough stuff to tell the difference. Um, if you're running a full node, you know, if it's an economic full node and you have a lot of value depending on it, the fact that it's a soft fork doesn't mean that you can relax and not upgrade. You should upgrade and you should upgrade quickly. The difference with a soft fork is that if you are, you know, on holiday and you don't get back for a few days, the miners are going to protect you while that happens. So it, it means that people can upgrade more flexibly and less co in a less coordinated way. Um, it is true that it, for the period where you haven't upgraded, you are to some extent a reduced security model, which is somewhat similar to the way a smartphone is trusting the miners. Um, but the, the intention is that it's a temporary thing and that people should upgrade. But now, going back to a previous question, um, we can observe that there's a lot of old software in the network. So to the extent that people are concerned about that, they should be concerned that there are people in the network running non-trivial percentages of the network running like very old software, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.10, 0 0.11. 0 0.11 is quite recent, but you know, the, um, that means all of those nodes are actually ongoing vulnerable to this. And I'm not sure of the exact statistics, but it might be like 30% of the network. Now, we don't know whether those are economic nodes, i.e if they're being used by an exchange or if they're just, you know, a node that isn't really being used by anybody. 
Um, so there is uh, one problem, which is that SPV clients can connect to them and get bad information if they're not up to date. But SPV clients tend to connect to multiple nodes and cross-check, so they would notice uh, a discrepancy. We hope, but you know, it's 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 not a fantastic situation that there is so much old software in the network, and. It's also an interesting effect that a, a, another example of anonymity or privacy that's beneficial having a negative side effect, which is we can actually tell which nodes are um, economic nodes and not. And it's good that we don't know because you know if, if you knew which nodes are economic, you'd have a map of that you could geolocate of where Bitcoins are to get somebody might go and try to steal them. So it's good that we don't know which are economic nodes, but it's problematic because you know, the ones that aren't economic, don't, it's not so important for them to upgrade, but the ones that are economic, if we knew they were economic, somebody should probably have a go at contacting them and suggesting they upgrade for their own safety kind of thing. So I think, you know, so from that perspective, segregated witness uh, soft fork is the same as any other soft fork. And I've, I've heard some people try to make the case that it's, it's somehow different, but I don't really ag agree or understand why they think that, because um, basically a soft fork is a soft fork. It means that there exists a, you know, uh, a, a transaction you could create which would look valid to an old node, but isn't actually valid. And using that, you can abuse that if you have hash rate to potentially defraud somebody who's using an SPV client. So. That, it seems to me that, that that packet, it doesn't matter too much what feature that packet uses or you know, what the effect of the soft fork is, that, that seems that that generally should create pretty much the same problem. So I view it as more analogous to, you know, if, if somebody has a, a, remote, a, root, a remote root exploit of Linux and it gains root, you don't really care that much why or how. It's a root exploit and it's game over. So. I think they're, they're basically any any soft forks equivalent, and people should economic nodes should upgrade relatively quickly, but that they are better protected during that period. The other thing to say about a soft fork is, you know, it's it's contrasted with a hard fork. That with a, with a hard fork, um, a different a different kind of failure happens, right? That the the old nodes are um, ignoring the current network, so they're on a low hash rate network. And so they, there's some risk that they would accept invalid transactions by somebody with a moderate amount of hash rate attacking that network uh, if they happen to connect to it. So it's a bit, bit random what they connect to, but maybe they can be network attacked. Um, so to the extent that you wanted to, and I, I believe there's steps to um, introduce this as a feature, you can make uh, wallets, full node wallets and SPV wallets that stop and warn you if they see transactions on the longest chain that are a newer version than you know how to understand. And at that point, the user is given a choice to you know, upgrade or continue in a kind of weakened security model. So that, that can be done equally with a soft or a hard fork. So it's kind of implicit in a hard fork, but that can, easily, that can equally be done. And I think as far as I understand, there are proposals to actually do that in a future release of Bitcoin. So that would make it much more equivalent in terms of you know, defaulting to stopping as opposed to um, continuing at risk without uh, making a decision to do that. So uh, unfortunately, we are out of our, our, our time. So thanks a lot, Adam, for your presentation. All of you, uh, thanks a lot for attending this presentation or his pres his presentation. Uh